I have shared the screen and I see that on my screen, we have the uh, polling feature. So should I turn that off or do I dare do that? No. <laughs> okay. That will stay up. That will stay up. Okay. It will stay up until we see that enough people have answered. Okay. So I will read around it then. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Um, it's a pleasure uh, this morning to, uh, to be part of this great initiative. Uh, and I want to especially thank Jody Michon and Dorothy Colby uh, for, uh, for arranging this. Uh, Jody, uh, both Jody and Dorothy, of course, are leaders in this field of addressing uh, dementia, uh, assisting families, uh, making life just a little better for everybody. And it's it's uh, and I want to thank you for that. And uh, Diane Tarada, thank you very much for the support uh, that we have uh, seen over the years. And uh, the uh, sponsors, the Administration for Community Living, the federal sponsors, Catholic Charities of Hawaii, the Circle of Care for Dementia, Hale Kuiki, of course, and that's Dorothy's platform we're using today. And on behalf of the uh, University of Hawaii Elder Law Program, uh, I, I want to uh, express my support for these initiatives and also uh, my thanks for being included uh, because uh, very often uh, legal issues are not addressed uh, as early as they should be. And hopefully in today's presentation, you'll see why it's important uh, to uh, look at some of the legal issues because every state has different laws and some laws in Hawaii are quite peculiar. And with that in mind, I hope that will keep you all interested uh, to figure out the peculiarities. I've already looked at the early results of your polling and we have some work to do today. So this is great. I'd also like to announce the uh, University of Hawaii Elder Law Program's 30th anniversary this year. It's hard to believe that we have been at the university for 30 years. And in celebration of this anniversary, we had this very beautiful um, Deciding What Matters and What to Do handbook that's available online. So we have a very simple um, uh, website uh, to access uh, this book. It's available at hawaii.edu backslash U-H-E-L-P. And of course, that stands for the University of Hawaii Elder Law Program. So you'll see a picture of the book on the front page of this uh, website. You can just click on the book and then we have all sorts of other resources up there. Uh, in, and we uh, hope that you uh, follow through with this session and look at this legal handbook because all of the subjects that I'm going to be talking about today are covered in, in this handbook. Um, and I might add that uh, thank you very much for, your, uh, for what you're going to be sitting through, um, law students and nursing students and uh, School of Medicine students uh, sometimes take an entire semester to go through all of these issues. So this will be quite a feat to get through all these topics today, but we'll try to make it as enjoyable as possible. So here are the topics, uh, decision-making capacity standards under Hawaii law. Uh, we'll look at a couple examples of how Hawaii law has defined certain issues regarding capacity, because when we're talking about dementia, it's not uh, uh, like turning on and off a light bulb. Uh, there may be stages and there still may be some decision-making capacity left in individuals who have been diagnosed with dementia. Dementia itself as a term um, is, is somewhat uh, controversial uh, and uh, there's a trend towards moving away from that term, but it's the term that people understand when you hear uh, you understand that it's something to do with the mind. We're going to be talking about just a little bit about guardianship and conservatorship. We're going to specialize more in the alternatives to court intervention. Uh, I changed this uh, lecture slightly for the law students because 
Uh, today, we're going to say, oh, you want to try to avoid those, alt uh, those uh, guardianship and conservatorship because it's very expensive um, and can be very expensive and can be quite time consuming. Uh, for the lawyers, well, that's not so bad, is it? Because guess who's going to be getting the money is the future lawyers and current lawyers. That's just a, a little bit of humor, but it, you may think it's true uh, that, uh, yeah, we, we, but we do preach alternatives to court intervention uh, in our classes because one should have a plan and it should not necessarily involve having to go to court to get uh, things resolved, although the courts are there in case something goes wrong. A, li a little bit about supported decision making in Hawaii. Uh, uh, David from the American Bar Association uh, talked about the trend across the nation uh, with respect to supported decision making in Hawaii. Several states have laws, but Hawaii lags behind in this area as well as in some other areas with respect to looking at issues uh, regarding dementia, but there is no Hawaii state law in it, but we'll, we'll fit that in a bit too. Powers of attorney under the 2014 Hawaii Uniform Power of Attorney Act. Now I saw the polling on that and yeah, we need to discuss what the new law says about, uh, about the powers that are granted and some of you may be quite surprised. Some of you may have had, uh, may have powers of attorney that are executed prior to 2014, so you should uh, pay special attention. Uh, if your loved one with dementia has one uh, that was executed prior to 2014, uh, don't, don't, don't tear it up. It's perfect. It can be perfectly fine, but um, if you have a chance and you're, uh, you or your loved one is still mentally capacitated, you should consider making one under the 2014 law. So we'll talk about that. Advanced healthcare directives and other healthcare planning tools under Hawaii law. This is um, so important. I serve on the ethics committee of a, uh, of a large hospital here in Honolulu. This comes up every time we have a meeting who is making healthcare decisions for the incapacitated person, what decisions are made, who is a legally authorized representative of the incapacitated person, what about conflicts between the, uh, the uh, surrogate decision maker, the agent or the guardian, and the patient preferences. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that too. Um, this area will also include Provider Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, or POLS, which are very popular today, and they serve a very useful purpose, but you should know um, how easy it is for somebody else to change your order that you signed with your doctor or advanced practice registered nurse. Um, and then we're going to engage in uh, the area of Hawaii laws protecting persons from abuse, neglect, and exploitation and especially our Adult Protective Services Statute. It's very important that we know that uh, COVID-19 has had a huge impact uh, on, on older persons. And uh, so here are a couple of quotes uh, with respect to COVID-19 and the impact uh, which, um, which it has had, including uh, reports of elder abuse um, on, on the population directed against older individuals. In today's uh, newspaper, uh, there was also an article uh, just on the science that the uh, individuals with dementia may be more susceptible to COVID-19. So this, this area of protecting and providing resources to individuals with dementia couldn't be much more important. And uh, we're all hoping, of course, that the, our government officials see it the same way and uh, dedicate uh, sufficient resources to addressing uh, dementia.
The theme I'm going to be uh, looking at is the balancing autonomy and self-determination with best interest and protection. Just because a person has dementia doesn't mean that they lose their, uh, the, their rights to uh, as much autonomy and self-determination as possible. And if, uh, if, if they have expressed what they want in advance, those desires, uh, normally speaking, should be followed. So we're, uh, we're talking about empowering people with diminished capacity to fully participate in life and to direct future decisions. This is what we talk about in healthcare decision making. That's why there, these some some of the documents are called advanced health advanced healthcare directives because it's in advance that we are um, that we are making these documents to tell people what we want and who we want to have uh, carry out these uh, these important duties. We'll see that similarly with other alternatives to guardianship and conservatorship. It's also, we're also talking about avoiding overly restrictive interventions often used to assure protection. Um, yes, protection is important, uh, but sometimes uh, se severe or restrictive interventions um, can really impinge upon a person's own uh, desires with respect to how they want to live. Uh, using uh, mediators and other facilitators to help address the areas of potential disagreement and conflict among family members and caregivers with respect to care and support a person with dementia. I'm happy to hear that the next session is going to address this very topic. So I encourage you uh, to enroll in the next webinar. And of course, uh, when we're balancing autonomy and self-determination with best interest and protection, we have to address protecting persons from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And uh, once again, persons with dementia may be more susceptible to abuse, neglect, uh, and including self-neglect and caregiver neglect and financial exploitation, as is the general older population. We continue to have what may be called a hidden epidemic of abuse because much of the abuse is hidden. For lawyers watching in, uh, you should note Rule 1.14, the Hawaii Rules of uh, Professional Conduct, uh, where we have uh, uh, issues relating to clients um, under uh, disability. Um, and then we also will have uh, the uh, requirements for healthcare professionals to report to uh, the uh, report cases of suspected abuse to what adult protective services. Capacity for what? So we're always asked to talk about capacity. So I throw back the question, capacity for what? There are decisional capacity levels that are required, and they are varying levels for each specific decision that needs to be made. So for example, starting at the lowest level of capacity within the legal spectrum is the will. It's you have, uh, you, it only requires um, a, a minimal capacity level to execute a will, but powers of attorney uh, healthcare decisions may require a higher level, but for wills, we have hundreds of years of standards with respect to how a person uh, can um, be deemed to have sufficient capacity to tell the world, to tell the state who they want to give their, uh, their worldly goods to upon their death. And it's such a natural thing uh, to, uh, to, give, uh, to want to give your uh, assets to your loved ones or other persons or not so loved ones, perhaps even uh, upon your death. Uh, so we'll see uh, a, a little bit about that in a second when we talk about specific capacity um, issues under Hawaii law. Who is making this assessment? Um, 
in our lawyers' offices, we see that attorneys, generally speaking, make their own assessments of capacity. We don't require a physician or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Uh, uh, we don't require them to provide uh, their assessment necessarily, unless we think we need some more help with respect to um, is uh, issues of uh, potential limited capacity. And then we might want to bring in a uh, an expert, a physician, uh, for example, a geriatrician. And you had already in this series, you've had uh, a geriatrician talk with you. You've had a couple of geriatricians. And I know that was a very popular webinar. And since they're archived, if you didn't attend that session, I would suggest that you look at those sessions. Psychiatrists, of course, provide assessments of capacity. I should also note that uh, psychologists um, are um, in this field and they provide a slightly different perspective on testing for capacity. As a matter of fact, uh, later on today, I have a psychologist coming to class, my uh, advanced uh, legal studies in healthcare, uh, health law uh, to be talking about uh, assessments, um, including assessment of capacity to make wills, powers of attorney, healthcare decision-making, and, and in future sessions about other areas of capacity, which are slightly different, such as fitness to stand trial. Capacity and undue influence are different, but they're very often linked. Very often you'll see a person with diminished capacity be more subject to undue influence, although an individual with what we might may think of as complete or just a perfect capacity, if there is such a thing, can also be subject to undue influence. We've all seen people who take advantage of individuals, and that's one way of exerting undue influence. And we see example after example of individuals uh, getting something from uh, uh, an individual or having that individual do some course of action uh, under that undue influence. And finally, uh, this whole subject area, uh, we have to think about decision-making in the absence of capacity. When the individual, uh, we all agree, completely lacks capacity. And uh, a simple example is in a with a person in a persistent vegetative state or in a coma. They don't have capacity. Uh, so we'll look at some legal instruments. We'll look at advanced directives. And we'll talk about this um, term surrogates because in English and across the country, surrogates means something. But under Hawaii law, it's a very particular definition that we have uh, on surrogates under the Uniform Healthcare Decisions Act that I will show you uh, a little later on. So here we have uh, different capacities uh, under the law and uh, each specific capacity, as I mentioned, um, may require a different level of capacity. So the provision of informed consent for medical treatment, the execution of a will, a trust, an advanced directive, or power of attorney. So I'll give you a couple of examples of um, for specific capacities under the law. So under Hawaii's uh, Uniform Healthcare Decisions Act, they define capacity. Capacity means the individual's ability to understand the significant benefits, risks, and alternatives to proposed healthcare and to make and communicate a healthcare decision. So when a healthcare provider, such as a doctor or a nurse, uh, is asking you questions and providing you information uh, and engaging you in conversation, they're also trying to figure out if you understand what the significant benefits, what the risks may be, and if you understand the alternatives to proposed healthcare. 
and whether or not you're able to communicate a healthcare decision. This is why it's important when you're uh, looking at uh, decision making um, in, in an attorney's office or even in a doctor's office is um, when a, a person, let's say with uh, some stage of dementia uh, appears with a caregiver or a family member um, that we, we will ask uh, that, uh, that we talk to the client alone so we can see uh, if, if we think that the person uh, has capacity and is not being um, given the answers uh, or sometimes, as you know, uh, you, you'll have somebody coming in with the older person and the uh, the question will be asked and it'll be answered by the companion, not by the, not by the patient or the client. So um, doctors, lawyers, other professionals uh, need to be assured that the individual has capacity. And also by, uh, uh, you should know that uh, this method also helps us to try to see if there may be some form of undue influence also. So we have a little discussion with the individual. Uh, under the Adult Protective Services Act, we see that capacity is slightly different, but it, uh, it has some uh, similar bearing. It's the ability to understand and appreciate the nature and consequences of making decisions concerning one's person or to communicate such decisions. The law points out that exploiting a vulnerable adult through undue influence may constitute abuse under the law, and the exploitation may involve coercion, manipulation, threats, intimidation, misrepresentation, or exertion of undue influence. So uh, in several areas of the law, these two concepts of capacity and undue influence uh, are addressed. So here we are uh, for one of the lowest levels of capacity uh, for a legal document. And this will be in making a will. And according to the statute, an individual 18 or more years of age who has a sound mind may make a will. Well, that sounds pretty simple. So we have interpretations by the court of what is capacity. And we have a sort of an older case on this, but um, in uh, this case uh, harkens back to many years of common law uh, brought down through, uh, through uh, England um, and uh, through our US constitution and our state law. And in order to be considered a sound mind, the court indicated that a person must understand the nature of the act being performed. That means they understand that this is a will, must know the nature and extent of one's property, uh, must be cognizant of the natural objects of one's bounty, um, and must be capable of forming an orderly scheme of distribution. So they know what they have, they know who's related to them. The natural object of one's bounty are the spouse, the children, grandchildren, uh, maybe brothers and sisters. And um, they must be capable of forming orderly scheme of distribution says, okay, I want, I want all four kids to get everything equally. So that's, that would be enough. Um, so uh, th these are just a couple of examples of capacity being addressed in the statute and um, if necessary to be interpreted by the courts. I told you that it's probably good to try to avoid guardianship and conservatorship uh, because it takes such a long time. Um, but also there are a couple of practical reasons that you may wish to do this. Guardianship and conservatorship are the legal mechanisms by which the judgment of a more capable person is substituted for a judgment of an impaired person. Um, and this is for decisions to manage the personal affairs, that would be for the guardianship, and property, which would be the conservatorship. 
only a court can appoint a guardian for a ward. A ward would be under guardianship um, or a conservatorship for a protected person. Protected person is a conservatorship. And medical testimony is usually required. So the court is going to rely on the expert testimony generally <clears throat> of a doctor um, or another a skilled person such as a uh, advanced practice registered nurse who is um, qualified in uh, psych psych uh, psychiatry or psychology or geri geri geriatrics. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you see uh, medical doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists writing to the court or testifying in court under rare circumstances. Guardianship should and conservatorship should only be considered when the uh, person's incapable of communicating necessary decisions for his or her own safety or for the property interest. And, and I underlined this, suitable or effective alternatives have not been set up or are not available. I mentioned a couple of times already, it can also be expensive and take a long time. I underlined suitable or effective alternatives have not been set up. Yes, we're going to be talking about and encouraging setting up these um, alternatives, but they may not be available. Um, we see it very often that as people get uh, older and they lose their family and they're left alone, maybe the person that they have appointed is no longer alive, is no longer available, is no longer capacitated. So even though a person has set up alternative, suitable, al effective alternatives, they may not be available. Um, and uh, so there may be a, a number of circumstances under which all the plans you have made are no longer um, available or possible. Guardianship and conservatorship, uh, the judge is supposed to balance the autonomy and self-determination uh, against protection and best interest. Uh, and judges have the duty to see uh, uh, that the autonomy and self-determination is preserved to the greatest extent possible. Practically speaking, guardianship and conservatorship cases are very quick. Um, you, you know from the newspapers and from other media that there are some uh, famous cases that take uh, weeks and weeks and weeks in court, but generally speaking, they're very perfunctory. And many times the subject of the guardianship or conservatorship is not even in court. Another thing that you should um, realize is that guardianship is different from involuntary civil commitment. Uh, people call us with respect to individuals who have uh, mental disorders and they are uh, imminently dangerous to self or others. And um, this is not the, uh, the area for a guardianship or conservatorship. They may need one, but for the uh, immediate uh, inter interventions, we're looking at uh, involuntary civil commitment uh, or involuntary treatment in the community. Again, I'm packing in quite a bit of um, information that would take a semester for uh, future lawyers and future uh, geriatricians and doctor of nurse practice, uh, doctors of nurse practice. Under the Uniform Guardianship and Protective Proceedings Act, we also have terminology. Um, and what is an inca incapacitated person? Well, here's their definition under the statute that the legislature gave it. This means an individual for reasons other than being a minor, because there's a guardianship of minors, of course, uh, but 
the, for an individual who is unable to receive and evaluate information or to make or communicate decisions to such an extent that the individual lacks the ability to meet essential requirements for physical health, safety, or self-care, even with appropriate and reasonably available technological assistance. So technology enters into this, but it, um, it's, it's factored in uh, when uh, an individual may have the ability uh, to uh, function without the need of a guardian or a conservatorship with technological assistance. I might also add that this is an area where we pause and, uh, and, and uh, say that in several states and in other, uh, in other jurisdictions across the world, uh, you'll see that there are other methods that, uh, that are used to assist an individual, to provide an individual with a level of care and a level of support uh, through which they may not need to have a full guardianship. But if you appoint an individual uh, to provide uh, protection and services to another, uh, and they are, uh, and, and there are resources in the community provided by law, uh, then it makes it a lot easier for the judge to say, well, we're not going to impose a, a complete guardianship. We may uh, impose a limited guardianship or conservatorship for a specific person, but they may not need to have the full, um, to full guardianship if uh, there are resources in the community. Hawaii is uh, lagging behind in this area. About a half a dozen states have uh, these uh, services available to individuals and make it part of the uh, process where individuals who may have limited capacity, uh, physical or mental, uh, receive services uh, under court order uh, or uh, in lieu of having uh, a guardianship or conservatorship. Now, just an interesting concept for individuals. Hawaii, of course, has some specific terminology that no other state has. Uh, and in Hawaii, there is a pokua kanavai, or helper in the law, and that's used instead of the term visitor or master in other states. And this uh, individual is not an advocate for or against the rights of an individual, but is uh, the role is in responding to the petition for protective proceeding. Uh, and the Kokua Kanavai without prior court uh, order has no authority to initiate actions on behalf of the protected person. Rather, the court could appoint a guardian ad litem for the protected person. So we have uh, various uh, abilities within the court system to provide individuals to look into matters, to receive information, uh, or to provide, um, um, act, to initiate actions on behalf of the protected person. Once again, terminology, ward is to guardian as protected person is to conservator. Uh, under the old law, uh, the terminology was guardian of the property, and some of you may have documents from loved ones uh, through which uh, a guardianship was accomplished. So you may see the terminology guardian of the property, but now it, uh, 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 it's uh, changed now to conservator. And under the uh, new law, uh, what used to be guardian of the person is now simply guardian. So when you're looking through uh, your loved one's documents and you see guarding the property, that translates now to conservator and uh, guarding the person is now simply guardian. When may a court appoint a limited or unlimited guardian uh, for the respondent? It can only do so when finds clear and convincing evidence that the respondent is an incapacitated person. And I mentioned the medical testimony that uh, they generally receive. 
and the respondent's identified needs cannot be met by less restrictive means, including the use of appropriate and reasonably available technological assistance. So this is where the court has a hearing and these are the, uh, these, this is the way, the, on, the only way that the court uh, would grant uh, a guardianship. For conservatorship, there are two basic areas. Uh, we'll see a similar area of, um, as with the guardian, um, and it's by clear and convincing evidence, the individual is unable to manage property and business affairs effectively because of an impairment in the ability to receive and evaluate information or to make or communicate decisions, even with the use of appropriate, reasonably available technological assistance, or because of some other physical, mental, or health impairment, or interestingly, and uh, we had a case many years ago, because the individual is missing, detained, or unable to return to the United States. So we had a case where an indiv individual had been missing for numerous years, just disappeared. And so uh, a conservator was uh, appointed. Um, and then eventually the person was declared to be dead under a different statute. Uh, the second area is by preponderance of evidence, which is a lower level of evidence that the individual has property that will be wasted or dissipated unless management is provided or money is needed for the support, care, education, health, and welfare of the individual or of individuals who are entitled to the individual support and that protection is necessary or desirable to obtain or provide money. So it could be the spouse or the children are relying on that individual and the individual is wasting the property, uh, such as spending the money, gambling, et cetera. When we talk about alternatives to um, guardianship, uh, one, of, one of them, uh, one of the alternatives that one could consider is a limited order. So uh, you could consider a limited versus what is called a plenary uh, order for guardianship. And the guardian is assigned only those duties and powers the incapacitated person is incapable of exercising. Now, this is what the court uh, is required to consider. Many judges, it seems, are of the opinion that, well, we know it's just going to get worse, so let's go ahead and, and grant it so we don't have to come back and have another hearing. But uh, more and more judges are limiting the powers uh, when the incapacitated person uh, demonstrates that they can uh, still function in some areas. Uh, so there are protective orders that can be um, initiated by the judge. And there can also, uh, under the conservative side, uh, again, we see um, parallels, but you can have a conservatorship for a specific person, a purpose. One, one example is the only thing grandma has is that bank account. Everything else is taken care of. So instead of going for a full conservatorship, uh, there can be a petition just to have authority to get into that bank account, to use it, to close it, to uh, whatever the judge uh, approves. So those are some examples of limited uh, guardianship and, protect and um, conservatorship for a specific purpose. What are these alternatives to guardianship and conservatorship. Um, I mentioned that we uh, have a limited guardianship and conservatorship. Also, the concept of providing extra help under a statute, uh, which is that concept of supportive decision making. We don't have a Hawaii statute as of now, but in some states they do. And in some countries, they appoint this uh, an individual to 
provide services, to provide care, to help the person, uh, to support them in their own decision-making. In Hawaii, unfortunately, very often, a guardianship or conservatorship will be initiated because there is no specific supported decision-making statute. Um, but uh, this is something that the legislature, I'm sure, will be dealing with as they see other states go forward uh, in this area. For selected traditional uh, uh, alternatives uh, that we are, are very common uh, throughout the years, um, we divide it up into two areas, personal and financial and legal matters. So you can almost see um, somewhat of a split between guardianship and conservatorship for alternatives. But in some areas, uh, there will be an intersection, uh, and that especially will be uh, with powers of attorney under the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. So for personal matters, that would be an alternative to uh, guardianship, you would see powers of attorney uh, under the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. I'll get into greater details, uh, but you'll uh, we'll also see advanced directives, including healthcare, a healthcare power of attorney. I uh, specifically mentioned the healthcare power of attorney on this slide because under the 2014 Uniform Power of Attorney Act, which is the regular power of attorney act, that changed the law to say that um, you can't have healthcare decision-making powers in a power of attorney executed under the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. So I see almost a 50-50 split uh, on that one. So be sure to know that in that power of attorney for the regular, probably a general power of attorney when you're planning for the future, I'll get into that terminology soon, but that doesn't include healthcare powers anymore. Some of you may have powers of attorney executed prior to 2014 that do include powers of attorney. Now, if it's uh, for yourself, uh, you may consider making a new power of attorney and new advanced healthcare directive, including the power of attorney for healthcare. Uh, once again, if it's for a loved one who has dementia and no longer has decisional capacity, don't do anything, don't tear it up, don't, don't destroy it, um, because most of the time, the language in there will be sufficient to take care of uh, both the healthcare and the other needs. But for current powers of attorney, the law says if you are giving healthcare powers of attorney, go to the Uniform Healthcare Decisions Act, where it says under their UHCDA, uh, to put it in a durable power of attorney for healthcare. For personal, uh, including healthcare matters, of course, we have the provider orders for life-sustaining treatment that I mentioned already. Uh, we'll see that 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 has some issues with respect to people changing them um, uh, with, uh, and, and it can be for good reason. Of course, uh, people's health change, uh, uh, their situations change, their desires change, circumstances change. There may be an issue of futility involved where it's no longer um, appropriate to have a full code, for example. Um, but just be aware that um, people that you don't, uh, wouldn't know can change it on you when you are incapacitated uh, do have that authority. So you have to make sure that your healthcare provider and your agent, for example, in the healthcare power of attorney understands uh, what you would like to do under those types of circumstances. Then I'll spend some time on surrogates. As I mentioned, it's not the same terminology as surrogates that you use in the English language or that is used in many other states. Surrogates has a very 
specific meaning under Hawaii law. Uh, and as a preview, that will be uh, the individual who is not an agent, who is not uh, under a healthcare power of attorney, is not a guardian, um, and has the authority to make healthcare decisions. And we have a peculiar system in Hawaii for figuring out who is a surrogate for healthcare decisions uh, when there is no guardian and no healthcare power of attorney uh, um, that can be used. Now, for alternatives to guardianship and conservatorship, we now go to financial and legal matters. Once again, we see the uh, powerful and uh, power of attorney under the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. We also see living trusts, which are very useful tools. Um, in a, a, a separate discussion, we can talk about the benefits of a living trust for uh, estate planning purposes, but living trusts can be a very effective tool for managing property and assets, uh, other assets uh, such as bank accounts, cars, uh, anything that you can hold title to um, during the lifetime of an ind individual when they become incapacitated. So living trusts are very useful tools for both um, estate planning purposes, but also for planning for future incapacity. Then we have such practical things as joint accounts and property management, uh, where we see uh, you, may be the, you may be on an account with mom or dad, uh, and you are helping them with that. All of these alternatives have pluses and minuses, and we see the joint account as having some very serious dangers involved that I'll go into a little more detail. But on that joint account, we're, we're, we recently received a case where uh, the nephew, uh, the grandson, uh, was reported by the uh, by uh, the child, um, and the grandson is the nephew of the child of this uh, mother, and the uh, this grandchild of the older person uh, now with dementia uh, gave a lot of trust to this person and everybody thinks that she was fooled uh, into not have into making a joint account with rights of survivorship so the one grandchild is going to receive most, if not all, of a very large estate uh, of this person uh, because he was being helpful to grandma to pay her bills. And everybody looked to him and said, okay, we got this uh, wheelchair or whatever uh, we need to pay uh, you know, for an upgrade to that, whatever they needed. And so I said, sure, 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 sure. Then it turns out that he owns everything upon her death. Uh, so they're looking into before she dies, how do you, what, how, what do we do about that? Um, for certain accounts, uh, such as uh, for social security and for uh, veterans benefits, uh, there are such things as representative payee ships for social security and appointed fiduciary for veterans benefits that can be used as an effective um, alternative to getting a conservatorship uh, for those uh, matters, uh, if that's uh, if that's the item in question that people need to have access to, for the support of the uh, social security beneficiary or the veteran. Okay, so let's uh, look at powers of attorney as an alternative to guardianship and conservatorship. Certain parts of guardianship, again, not the health care. There are different types of powers of attorney. Uh, but before we get to that, I put in red capacity because we get calls uh, from people saying, oh, the geriatrician says it, mom now finally has uh, such a high level of uh, dementia that she's no longer capable of making decisions 
or to taking care of her finances. So they, the, they encourage us to go talk to a lawyer. Well, and to get a power of attorney. It's too late under most circumstances. Um, so capacity is a requirement in order to execute a power of attorney. So the attorney would assess the individual to see if they have sufficient capacity to execute a power of attorney and that they were not under undue influence. So there are different types of powers of attorney. Um, there are durable, all these terminologies, durable, springing, general, special, and then healthcare in parentheses, because we know that under the Uniform Power of Attorney Act, uh, you uh, don't put the healthcare powers in there. But uh, very quickly, uh, durable means that the power of attorney can, can continue uh, through the incapacity of, uh, of, of a person. Under the old law, the uh, default was that unless you specifically address the issue, the power of attorney was not durable. But very quickly for this slide, the uh, default under current Hawaii law since 2014 is that um, it is that will continue through the incapacity of the individual until the uh, person's death. A springing power of attorney is a power of attorney that springs into effect upon a certain condition. So under the uh, in, uh, old law, very often people would say, if I should become incapacitated, then this power of attorney springs into effect. Under the new law, by default, the power of attorney is effective immediately and is durable. So you don't need to have it spring into effect upon uh, incapacity. But if you don't want people to have control uh, immediately and you're perfectly capacitated yourself, you're just planning for future incapacity, you should consider having that power spring into effect only upon your incapacity because otherwise uh, the, your agent can use that power of attorney for good or for bad sometimes. So, um, so those are considerations. There are general powers of attorney and special powers of attorney. General powers of attorney attempt to provide many powers to the individual. And those are general powers of attorney are those uh, types of powers of attorney that you would look to as alternatives to guardianship and conservatorship. Special powers of attorney limit the powers, and sometimes you may wish to limit the powers if you don't quite trust an agent uh, completely. So if you want the agent to have the authority to sell your car, uh, don't, you don't necessarily, you shouldn't necessarily give them a full general power of attorney because they can use the power of attorney for other things. But that's a very um, individualized decision. Once again, healthcare, and we'll talk about healthcare uh, when we talk about advanced directives, but healthcare is not included uh, in, in, the, uh, in the realm of under the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. Um, but these, for, this slide is for general uh, terminology. Other terms, the principal is uh, the person giving the power to the agent. Uh, the agent is the person who receives the power. Um, under the old law um, and under old practice, very often you would see the term attorney in fact, uh, that is now changed to agent. So in the past, you saw the term, you could see the term agent or attorney in fact, but now it's just agent that you will see. But if in one of the old documents, you see attorney in fact, that's an agent. 
Of course, uh, there are dangers involved in powers of attorney. Powers of attorney um, in some literature have been seen as licenses to steal, if you want to be that dramatic. Uh, so it's best to plan for the worst. So think of it as a potential license to steal, but put in place protections. I'm not saying don't execute a document, but be aware of the dangers that may be involved. So here's the new or 2014 uh, Uniform Power of Attorney Act. It's in a new chapter in the, in the, um, uh, in the statute. It provides for general or special or limited powers of attorney. Uh, healthcare powers and some other powers are not included in the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. Um, I think I've <laughs> reiterated that uh, and uh, stop nagging, but um, that for your, for your post quiz, you'll know that, nope, you can't have it in there. Um, you shouldn't have it in there. Uh, capacity uh, is, is key once again. So I'll talk about capacity because this webinar is on dementia. You have to have sufficient capacity. If, you, if your loved one has diminished capacity, it doesn't mean that you can't take that person or have the person zoom in with a, uh, with a lawyer these days until things get back to normal. But um, it, it's important that the attorney uh, get a sense of the capacity of the individual. Uh, there are specific protections provided under the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. So when I say danger, danger, there are protections to the principal, the uh, uh, agent, and persons accepting power of attorney. Uh, the execution uh, can, under the statute, be authenticated and I'm suggesting that it should be authenticated. And the uh, authentication under the statute merely means that it's notarized. Under this new or 2014 law, so it's getting kind of old uh, statute, um, you can make a power of attorney that doesn't need to be notarized and people may accept it. So banks may accept it. But the difference is, is if it's authenticated, otherwise known as notarized, then under most circumstances, it generally must be accepted. Um, under the old statute, nobody had to accept a power of attorney. But under this statute, yes, it must be accepted or uh, uh, the person receiving it let's use the example of the bank, may ask for a certification from a lawyer saying that this is uh, authentic and good power of attorney, or sometime um, it uh, need, may need a translation if it's uh, not in English, uh, or it may need a legal counsel's opinion. But generally speaking, uh, if it's authenticated, it must be accepted. So authenticated again means notarized. So that's where I say it can be, but it should be authenticated if you want it accepted. It's durable by default uh, or it can be springing. So remember that if you don't want it uh, to um, uh, be, uh, have uh, any, uh, so the two concepts are durable uh, by default uh, and so if you don't want it durable, uh, you can say that, uh, no, this ex the, the, my agent's powers expire upon my incapacity because you don't trust them anymore. Uh, you could have uh, another plan uh, with another agent where then it goes into effect springing. So there are a variety of uh, tools of the trade that attorneys can use. Uh, the agents, uh, Certification is included in the statute and that provides some protection for the principal because the agent actually will sign and have notarized a certification that 
uh, that the um, that they understand the duties and that they have a, a fiduciary responsibility to the principal, uh, but um, and and they also will note in there that the court has jurisdiction uh, should they breach this fiduciary responsibility. The court has jurisdiction at any rate over any agent, but it's. Um, it, it, sometimes it'll just put a little fear in the in, in the agents' uh, minds that well maybe I shouldn't uh, take advantage of this power of attorney. So they are to act as a fiduciary uh, for the benefit of the principal. Again, the dangers uh, can be used uh, as a as a license to steal. We saw a case where a sister did that and transferred uh, ownership uh, of her sister's house to her own child. So now the nephew and the older person um, have, uh, have their names on the house together. And now one of uh, the, the individuals incapacitated. So it's a mess and there are dangers. Here is... Uh, Here's where the dangers start and um, get worse <laughs> if, if you're worried about it. This would create a general power of attorney if you look at the bottom of this list and you see all preceding subjects. So if you initial that, that means for real property, tangible personal property, stocks and bonds, commodities and options, banks and other financial institutions, operations of an entity or business, insurance and annuities, estates, trusts, and other beneficial interests, claims and litigation, personal and family maintenance, benefits from governmental programs or civil or military service, retirement plan, plans, and taxes. Well, that's quite a list, but the description of what's included in that list goes on for dozens and dozens of pages. So you should know what you're initialing, and especially if you're initialing all preceding subjects. It gives a lot of power. So basically, you're granting all powers that you have to another person. With the next slide, um, which um, we don't recommend that everybody or many people execute, these are the so-called hot powers under the law, and you see even more dangers here. Uh, it's the grant of specific authority, and under the statute even, it says optional. My agent may not do any of the following specific acts for me unless I have initial the specific authority. You can see that it grants a lot of power. Uh, create, amend, revoke, or terminate an inter vivos trust. The trust that I mentioned before as an alternative, and we'll talk a little bit more about the trust as an alternative to conservatorship. Well, your agent can create, amend, revoke, uh, and in the case of if you made one already to amend, revoke, or terminate that trust, uh, make a gift, uh, create or change rights of survivorship, in which you may have and, and uh, combined with the create or change of beneficiary designation, that's a lot of power uh, for a bank account, uh, survivorship um, issues of uh, accounts, um, and uh, who, who for uh, pensions, for example, authorize another person to exercise the authority granted under this power of attorney. So let's say you have two children and one you wouldn't trust as far as you could throw them. So you give the authority to the other child. But if you mark this box, that child can authorize the, the other child that you don't trust to um, exercise the authority. Of course, they're under the law, there are protections and the court has jurisdiction. And if they act in a non-fiduciary manner, uh, the court um, can rectify that situation, but the money may be gone or nobody may know about this because powers of attorney 
are generally not uh, seen by anybody except uh, within the confines of the agent and the uh, principal agent relationship and maybe within the family, but um, maybe nobody will know what's going on. Um, with these powers, uh, hot powers can waive the principal's right to be a beneficiary of a joint and survivor annuity, including a survivor, including survivor benefit under a retirement plan and exercise fiduciary powers that the principal has the authority to delegate. So you can delegate those powers that the principal has the authority to delegate or uh, exercise the powers that the principal has the authority to delegate. So very powerful document, very dangerous. Uh, that's why you need to talk with your lawyer before executing these types of documents. And you can see that uh, why it's important that lawyers uh, attempt to make sure that the person has not only capacity, but is not under any undue influence. And then is there a plan later on to follow up um, to see what's going on? In the elder law practice, uh, this can happen because you can say, look, I, uh, attorney, I want you to continue to be my attorney uh, for years and years and years. And once in a while, check in on me um, and to make sure that everything's fine and to have a continual relationship. Many attorneys will just say, uh, no, we're done with that. I did the power of attorney. You're no longer my client. Um, and if you want to connect again, we have to enter into another agreement. So life can be complicated, even if you want that attorney to stay in your life. Very briefly, I already mentioned some of these, that the general differences uh, in, uh, to the law prior to March of 2014. Um, it, there's a default now durable with respect to a power of attorney not terminated by the principal's incapacity. Uh, it's, the default is now the power of attorney is effective immediately uh, unless specifically provided otherwise. Uh, an interesting thing, it revokes a spouse agent's authority upon divorce uh, unless expressly provided otherwise in the power of attorney. So if you get divorced um, and you no longer want your ex-spouse to have the authority and the power of attorney, the law is good. But very often these days, you see ex-spouses um, continuing to, to help help each other. And so this is where it's very individualized. And then I mentioned already the agent's certification to the validity of the power of attorney and the agent's authority. Trusts, uh, it's, it's a whole several sessions, but there are different types of trust. The testamentary trust in uh, parentheses is not the type of trust that you use to plan for future incapacity because a testamentary trust is a trust that's included in a will. So um, if you hearken back to older days, you may have had a, uh, a, uh, a will that says, I give everything to my spouse, uh, but if I should die, it goes to my two children. But your two children are two and four years old so in that will, you say, I give it in trust to auntie as trustee, trustee uh, for the benefit of my children until they reach such and such an age. So that's a testamentary trust, will not work uh, for, for your own planning for future uh, because the testamentary trust only goes into effect when you die. Uh, we're talking about uh, a living trust, which can be revocable or irrevocable. So it's the living trust that you establish. Uh, the important factors uh, for a living trust is that it be funded. You can have the greatest uh, trust ever crafted, and complex as much as you want with all the terminology. Even the best trust attorney will have a hard time figuring out 
Um, but if you don't put anything in it, it's worthless. So it can be in that rich Corinthian binder. Uh, but if you, let's say you are desirous of having the trust manage your uh, bank account and to have control over your home, for example, to manage your home and other property, you have to legally transfer it into the trust. For a, a home, it would be through a deed. And for uh, bank accounts and automobiles, it would be through changing uh, the, the, how, the, uh, how it's held by uh, going to the bank and signing documents or to the DMV, if ever you can get to the DMV uh, again. Um, that's another COVID issue, of course. Um, there are revocable trusts, which you can revoke at any time. You change your mind. Uh, you change things in the trust. This is the normal way. There are certain irrevocable trusts that can be, some people don't know that they signed an irrevocable trust and years later, they came, they call and say, um, how do I revoke this irrevocable trust? Well, with great difficulty, if at all, there may be certain good reasons to have an irrevocable trust, but generally speaking, it should be revocable, but you can revoke it at any time. Um, I did mention, uh, I, the thought came into my mind, I did mention that you can transfer your home into uh, your uh, trust. But if you're thinking about Medicaid planning and eventually needing uh, Medicaid for long-term care, if you have a, your home in a trust, it's no longer an exempt asset. It's just an aside, but it gives you a hint as to one of the second to last slide that I'm going to show you that many, many things need to be taken into consideration. This is where the attorney will say, oh, hold it. Uh, there may be some Medicaid issues if you transfer that home into your trust and you're going to plan for uh, Medicaid. So that's why an attorney should be, uh, uh, should be consulted. There are also special needs trusts uh, that can be set up for individuals who have special needs, uh, certain disabilities, either younger or older individuals. Uh, and then they, uh, uh, they would still be able to qualify for certain public benefits, but that's a whole specialty area in and of itself. I put danger on this, this slide too, because just because a person is a trustee, that name implies trust, um, doesn't mean that they can't um, take advantage of the situation. So be very careful about this, about setting it up, about uh, whether it's irrevocable, about what you put in the trust or you fail to put into a trust, because just setting up a trust doesn't necessarily mean that you have a an effective alternative to uh, conservatorship. Money management, uh, there are personal money managers or organizations that handle finances for an individual. They can help with paying bills, managing finances, handling investments, troubleshooting. And of course, um, that takes a lot of burden off of individuals. Very often they will ask for a power of attorney in order that they have access to your accounts. Uh, so there are some dangers involved, but generally speaking, if it's a reputable uh, organization or individual that you know of uh, that, um, that is bonded and um, insured and licensed, uh, then, um, then this is an effective way, can be an effective way of handling some of the alternatives to conservatorship for an individual who has a hard time coping with, uh, with their finances. These days, online uh, banking and including automatic bill paying is, is very an, uh, is an effective tool to avoiding a lot of the issues we see with conservatorship. Of course, you're going to see a lot of danger starting with the bottom uh, bullet uh, of the common use of ATM 
access where grandma tells the grandchild to go to the ATM, we need some more money. And um, we, we see that unfortunately where that uh, grandma is uh, taken advantage of. Um, the individuals with um, access to online account, of course, can control everything that goes on, including taking out all the money. But for most families, this is great uh, it, for managing the assets, paying the bills. They're not going to take out all the money for themselves. They're, they're, you know, this is, this is family. So it's a good alternative to having to have uh, uh, a, a process that may lead to conservatorship. You have effective use of powers of attorney, of of uh, trusts, of and, and online banking, automatic bill paying, it makes it a lot easier for everybody. Of course, periodic monitoring is helpful. For uh, siblings that don't trust each other, uh, the monitoring may include uh, mom or dad saying, okay, uh, every, every year you get together, show everybody the accounts, see where the money's going. Um, and uh, so that that generally speaking may be useful, including the use of power of attorney and, um, and being a trustee. So it's, it's up to the uh, individual setting up the alternative um, when you're dealing with um, family issues um, and family hurt and uh, people feeling that somebody may be taking advantage of you. Representative payeeships and appointed fiduciaries, the Social Security Administration and VA, they each have uh, their own methods of, uh, of uh, setting these up. And uh, the uh, Social Security Administration has millions of people who uh, are representative payees for an individual who is unable to manage their, their account. Um, and they have the paperwork and procedures for appointing, um, and it can uh, be changed or revoked only if the Social Security Administration consents. Of course, there are dangers here, even with Social Security oversight. There have been scandals across the country for many decades with respect to represented payeeships, um, including um, the representative payee still receiving um, the uh, uh, monies uh, for for a beneficiary who has been dead for a while, and so um, Jim, Jim, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're almost at eleven thirty, and we have questions. Okay, all right. And um, I don't know how many more you have, but I hate to interrupt you. I'll get off right now, but. Okay. In order, uh, I hope you have a little time to answer the questions. Yes, yes, I will. So, oh, good, good, good. Okay, then. All right. Thanks. So let's have jointly held property. Um, and we've already talked a little bit about that. Support decision making, no Hawaii law. In uh, the alternatives of guardianship, the health care decisions um, under the Uniform Health Care Decisions Act, you already know that the Uniform Power of Attorney Act does not include health care powers. Uh, but the Uniform Health Care Decisions Act does. Uh, separate statute for the polls. We'll get into the power of attorney uh, and the individual instructions. So under the Uniform Health Care Decisions Act, you have um, individual instructions for health care. They may be oral or written. So the individual instructions for health care do not to be, need to be in writing and accordingly do not need to be witnessed, notarized, dated, signed, or anything. They may be made orally to a healthcare provider, for example. So on your uh, post quiz, uh, where you, uh, I see many of you say that they need to be um, um, uh, signed, dated, uh, and witnessed or notarized, that is not true. But the durable power of attorney, which includes the uh, for healthcare decisions, um, does need to be in writing, dated, signed, and witnessed by two qualified individuals or notarized. Of course, it may be revoked. 
and it authorizes an agent to make any healthcare decision for an individual. And um, it can be effective immediately or only upon incapacity. Now, surrogates under the law is, I mentioned already that it's a person other than a patient's agent or guardian authorized under the statute. We do not have a hierarchy as many other states. So the surrogate has a specific meaning under Hawaii law, um, but we uh, other states have a uh, default where if you are the spouse or the adult child of an individual who lacks capacity, you may immediately have authority. But in Hawaii, um, you uh, may designate or disqualify an individual by uh, to act as your surrogate by informing the supervising healthcare provider. Usually that's the uh, your physician um, and the they can make all healthcare decisions for you. Non-designated surrogates is a different process. Only in Hawaii and uh, two other states now have a similar system, but it relies on interested persons who are gathered together by the primary physician or the physician's designee to make healthcare decisions on behalf of the patient. Uh, the interested persons can include the spouse, uh, adult children, siblings, grandchildren, or any adult who has exhibited special care and concern for the patient and who is familiar with the patient's personal values. If anybody disagrees, then you're back to what we talked about before, guardianship. So if there is no consensus and the individual doesn't ha has not designated an individual to be their circuit or has not designated to be an individual uh, to, to be an agent in a healthcare power of attorney, then uh, the, it goes back to guardianship. There are restrictions on artificial nutrition and hydration uh, withheld withholding and withdrawal. Uh, on behalf of the uh, non-designated surrogate. So they can make all other healthcare decisions, but it's difficult for them to, to do that. One of the obligations of the surrogate is to provide a written declaration under the penalty of false swearing, stating facts and circumstances reasonably sufficient to establish the claimed authority. Um, very often they get calls from healthcare facilities. They have these forms ready for the surrogate. Every facility has a slightly different format. And um, healthcare providers need to comply with your instructions um, and uh, of the authorized person. I'm going to skip forward to the um, post. I caution you again that the, the uh, at any time a patient um, or if incapacitated, the patient's legally authorized representative may request alternative treatment and they can revoke, uh, change or revoke the form at any time in, in any manner uh, to demonstrate the intent to revoke. So most of you got that correct on the post as a yes, uh, a legally authorized representative such as the guardian or the agent may revoke uh, or change that pulse form. Adult Protective Services was covered quite capably under uh, with David uh, the, in the last session. So you'll have these slides uh, available to you, but uh, it just repeats many of the things that he said. There are a variety of laws used to protect abused older persons, including the penal code um, and other uh, laws, but the the most effective is uh, the most uh, uh, commonly thought of rule uh, law is the Adult Protective Services, which requires the uh, Adult Protective Service to investigate cases of abuse of a vulnerable adult who has incurred abuse or is in danger of abuse if immediate action is not taken. It requires certain people 
people to promptly report the matter to uh, Adult Protective Services, and that includes most healthcare providers, and the family court has jurisdiction. You, David's uh, talk uh, talked about vulnerable adults and how that's changed from the um, uh, uh, using age as a criteria. He also talked about different types of abuse. Um, and we have uh, mandated uh, uh, reports. What uh, you should know, and we get calls about this, complaining about adult protective services, and uh, it, it's that under Hawaii Adult Protective Services statute, the Department of Human Services Department, uh, the Human Services, the department must have the consent of the victim before an investigation or protective action can commence unless the court finds that there is probable cause to believe that the vulnerable adult lacks capacity, and in this under the statute, to make decisions concerning the vulnerable adult's person. Um, so yes, you have to have consent unless the court, and they have to go to court and provide evidence to the court that the person lacks capacity. They can't go forward if the person says, leave me alone. And there are different types of abuse that have uh, the previous webinar went through, including caregiver neglect. Self-neglect is a very interesting issue and that is reportable, but they can only um, uh, go into a case with the consent in the vulnerable adult, where the vulnerable adult appears to lack sufficient under, uh, with, uh, without consent, uh, to lack sufficient understanding or capacity to make or communicate responsible decision and, and appears to be exposed to a situation or condition that poses an immediate risk of death or serious physical harm. So yes, self-neglect is included, but we go back to the capacity issue that all vulnerable adults um, uh, and victims uh, are you cannot um, enter into their lives without their consent. And here, including for self-neglect, they have to lack understanding um, to make or communicate a uh, responsible decision. But there's the additional thing for self-neglect and that that person appears to be exposed to a situation or condition that poses an immediate risk of death or serious physical harm. So here we are with the uh, specific uh, uh, questions that I had and, um, and each specific that involves a decision may have a different required level of decision capacity. Yes, we went through different levels, uh, different definitions and discussed different levels. Under Hawaii law, individuals, instructions for healthcare must be signed, dated and witnessed or notarized, no. Under Hawaii law, if a person's incapacity, the patient's legally authorized representative may revoke provider orders for life-sustained treatment at any time in any manner that communicates an intent to revoke, true. In Hawaii, healthcare providers may be included in general powers of attorney executed under the provision of the Uniform Power of Attorney Act, no. Um, I repeated that many times and under uh, Adult Protective Services Act must have the consent of the victim. Um, and uh, basically without the consent, uh, the longer version that I put up here is that the statute says that there's probable cause to believe that the vulnerable adult lacks the capacity to make decisions concerning the vulnerable adult's person. So uh, we are done with this um, area of the law. Um, David uh, covered that in his sessions. Uh, I just received the um, 2020 statewide problems referred to adult protective services the other day. You can see on this slide that caregiver neglect uh, and financial exploitation and self-neglect are the leading causes of uh, reports to adult protective services. You'll also see that there are cases of physical abuse, psychological abuse, 
and sexual abuse. Now the frightening slide is uh, topics and, uh, and uh, other considerations, uh, statutes uh, of what lawyers will be talking to you about and to your family members about when planning for future incapacity uh, and uh, looking at your own capacity and undue influence, guardianship, conservatorship, the uh, alternatives, uh, other added things are written instruments to control the disposition of your remains. That's a rather new statute. Should This is why lawyers are very helpful because they keep up with the changes in law. There have been many fights in the state of Hawaii over disposition remains. Now you can control those. Planning for long-term care, including Medicare, Medicaid, VA, uh, elder abuse, of course, caregiver issues, estate planning, wills and trusts, and many, many more. All right. Um, I am glad uh, to answer your questions.